Okay, let's move on to uh, our next our next team principal, Mike Crack, uh, Aston Martin. Uh, best season to date, finished fifth in the championship on 280 points. Big year for Aston Martin, new factory, and an incredible first half of the season or first eight races, six podiums in eight races for Aston Martin and for Fernando Alonso. Middle part of the season, Crofty, it got a little bit trickier, didn't it? And how would you rate how Mike Crack was able to navigate the stormy waters, as it were, of the middle of the Formula One season? It was a tricky, tricky task for him. Um, the, the downside, and being a West Ham fan, I'm always aware of this, the downside to starting well is that the doubts always creep in. You know, there's there's nothing. The only thing worse for my team than being a goal down is being a goal up, uh, quite frankly. But you know when you're performing well and it hasn't happened before, the doubts are going to creep in. You're not used to this level of, of success. And something happened around about Spain time. Canada was a bit of an anomaly in terms of, of the setup. But I think something happened with that Aston Martin car that it they tried to chase performance too quickly, R bringing upgrades to the track that maybe the team weren't totally on top of before they got to the track. When the final upgrade came in that made things worse, that they then got rid of and went back to finessing the Zandvoort upgrade, that's when they picked up performance again, but never to the extent of the start of the season. When you've got the owner is Lawrence Stroll, big character, um, you know, he's putting all the money, it's all Lawrence's money and his and his uh, co-investors. And then you've got Martin Whitmarsh as the group CEO, a guy who has very successfully run McLaren and other big tech businesses uh, in the aerospace world before that. Um, and still maybe thinks that, I don't know whether he, Whitmarsh does think he has, has something to prove in Formula One, but is keen to get involved, that's certainly fair to say, then I think the reason that I've put Mike Crack as, as second in second out of 10, two, uh, second best, nine points in the HR, is that he kept the owner happy. He kept the person above him, Martin Whitmarsh, happy. He kept Fernando Alonso happy. He kept his technical people happy. He kept Lance Stroll happy. And all of that made him, I think, the, the, the second best in terms of human relations um, team principal out there this year. In terms of dealing with the media, Crofty, I completely agree with you. He used to schedule um, t uh, media sessions at times that the media would never be at the circuit, like 7.30 in the morning. So uh, he thought, well, that's the only slot I've got. Uh, the rest of the time I need to devote to engineering and stuff that's going to make the car go quicker. So quite rightly, you media can come in at a time that, suit that suits me, not you. And what do you know? Nobody turned up because... <laughs> <laughs> it was all too early or it was before their buses their buses got in or whatever so media actually i've uh, put him down as as eighth um in terms of scheduling and uh, wasn't always what's the best way to put it he wasn't always clearly explaining what had happened to the car if he knew. And that's what I think, just to expand on what you're saying, Crofty, in the middle of the season, they kind of blamed, Fernando half blamed the tyres halfway through the season, then he blamed um, uh, some new bits in the front wing. I wasn't really aware of, of that. And then they eventually got round to whether it was the new floor in... Uh, Austin that didn't really work and then they took it off and then that's what led to the to the to the podium in Brazil um that there was the problem he wasn't always fully explaining assuming that he did know to the media exactly where Aston's pace went in the middle of the season you he would say well it's nothing to do with you media thanks for coming but go away it's for us to do in the team which is a, as again a particularly a very very fair point and why in leadership I've actually got Mike uh, Crack as uh, sixth, just behind James Vowles. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think a good season and um, well-tempered, well-liked man. Uh, gone after the points with Andy Stevenson that they missed in Austria because of the track limits thing, which I think was great. Without yep. those points, might have been very costly for them uh, at the end of the season in the constructors. And, of course, he had to put up uh, with all the jokes about his name, not least from um, some of our colleagues. So uh, he did that with good grace and uh good humor and uh yeah he's he's a very very solid um sort of mid table for me it was their best season ever and it brought eight podiums it brought a fifth place um that could have been so much better but you know there's something to aim at for next year 
and Aston Martin should be hugely proud of their achievements in 2023. But the pressure's on because Mike's bedded in now as team principal. Aston Martin need need a voice on on the on the big stage amongst the other teams. He needs to, I think, grow into the the Toto Wolf, the Christian Horner, the Fred Vasseur uh, kind of role. And, and so does our next team principal uh, that we'll get onto in a moment, because that's the aspirations uh, of Aston Martin to be competing with the big teams. And that's not just on the track, but that's off the track as well. And, and also, you know, you've mentioned that they, they they moved into the new factory to do everything they've done whilst basically whilst moving house. I mean, it, if Ted stood up, you'd see that he's still <laughs> unpacking boxes in his house. I mean, look at this. I mean, he, how long have you been in that place now? Uh, a year and I start, I've had to hide that packing box with a nice a nice cushion so uh, yeah <laughs> you know, it's difficult it is difficult it is trying difficult to find the time to find to, the time to move house and compete on a racetrack every other week <laughs> you know is damn near impossible and Ted's had races off <laughs> Impressive. Uh, yes. Uh, look, I, I, one more com one more comment on Mike Crack as well. I think the the Lance Stroll perform or the the Lance Stroll performances in the second half of the season were, were very interesting. I think it all came to a head in Qatar, didn't it? When he when he pushed pushed someone uh, in the in the garage, and I think I I, did, I I think that maybe could it that seemed to spill over into the media, and I do wonder if there was anything more he could have done as the team principal, perhaps. But then it is very difficult when the owner of the team is is. Lance Stroll's father, it's very unique circumstances. So perhaps he did very well given the situation that he found himself I, I would say day. behind the scenes, knowing Mike as I do, he would have been addressing the issues uh, head on and um, they, would have, they would have found a way to help Lance through that. And I think Mike is very good at that. The, uh, the pastoral mm -hmm. care side of being a team principal i think he's very yeah. very good at that but i think you know talking to the media about it be it consciously or or or, or subconsciously that's not something you wanted to do yeah he wasn't interested yeah good yeah. fair enough okay uh mike crack so ted 26 points for you uh crofty you got 24 points for, for mike and then i gave him 25 so I think in many we're... ways, I mean, what, you know, had we not had such good scores for James Vowles and Andrea Stello, who we'll come on to in a bit, um, I think Mike Crack could have finished higher than he did mm. because I think he had a very good season. Let's move on then to talk about Andrea Stella. And actually, interestingly, they experienced a mid-season turnaround, whereas obviously Mike was was uh, was overseeing the beginning of the season turnaround for Aston Martin. So in many ways, their sort of performances on track were slightly mirrored in, in the sense of in the sense of how well they did and, and maybe the unexpected nature of it. But yeah, look, McLaren, brilliant season, probably one of the best mid-season turnarounds ever in the history of Formula One. I, th I think we could probably... I, I don't uh, want to say Lazarus-esque, but let's say yeah. it. Lazarus-esque. <laughs> From where that car was... You do one. Yeah. This this thing rose like Lazarus of old. If you think back to where McLaren were at the start of the year in Bahrain, almost certainly the slowest car, if not one of the slowest cars to, to turn it around. Incredible. Um, Ted, take take the floor in, in terms of where what you see, the strengths of Andrea Stella. Um, uh, so I've year. actually marked Stella first in the, in the HR department um, out of 10. And that is because... Uh, of the way that he explained his differing roles. So he's been with McLaren for a while, um, was at Ferrari before that, won a championship with Kimi Raikkonen, and um, uh, almost won another championship with Fernando Alonso. But when he was racing director of McLaren, all he needed to know were the 300 people or so who were in his, in his group. And the way he explained it, when he took over as team principal, when Zach gave him that job after Andreas Seidel left for Sauber, he needed to get to know the other 800 people that make up McLaren. And not only has he done that, and he is not an extravagant, flamboyant figure, he has done that with respect and admiration and has kept everybody together at what could have been, after the early season disappointments for McLaren, a very fractious 
and potentially um, spiraling time. But he's done a great job on the HR. That McLaren, for large parts of the season, was the second fastest car in Formula One, arguably the only t uh, car that worried Max Verstappen in the hands of maybe Lando Norris or Oscar Piastri on a, on, a, on a regular basis, together with Carlos Sainz, the only other car that won a race. Yes, it was a sprint race, but it still won a race apart from the Red Bull this year. So technical, uh, once they got going, is very good. Um, leadership, I got Stella actually uh, a little bit further down because it was his first year and because he is a quiet man softly spoken in the greatest traditions uh, of Ross Braun. Media and sponsorship, I've got Stella second because while he's very good um, with the media, he'll always answer questions. There is that Zach Brown element above him who deals with the sponsorship. So it is a slightly sort of split uh, team principle. Um, but yeah, I mean, I must say when he was first... I mean, uh, people might not know this about me, um, but I've got a soft spot for McLaren. People think I've got a soft spot for another team. It's actually not true. Uh, I have, a, If there is a team that I have a soft spot for, it's for McLaren, because growing up, I always loved Ayrton Senna. I admired the job that Ro Ron Dennis did uh, and Martin Whitmarsh and, uh, and, and, uh, and Dave Ryan and going back a long time. Anyway, if I do have a soft spot, it's for McLaren. Um, not the team you think I have a soft spot for. Um, but but it's true. Cut him in half, if he bleeds red and white. I do. I, I mean, not I papaya. It's true. Red and white. It's true, not papaya. Um, when a guy, and, and I sort of embodied Ron Dennis for a minute, when a guy who had won a championship for Ferrari became the McLaren team principal, you know, in my Ron Dennis head, I was kind of, you know, does not compute, does not compute. But he made it work. He made it work. And in the, you know, in, 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 the, in the glory days that I grew up in, where McLaren and Ferrari could not have been more keen enemies, for a guy who's won, an Italian guy who's won a championship for Ferrari, is now the McLaren team principal. This isn't going to work, but it did work really well. And that's what I'm so happy with. He's a very personable guy. He's good with the media. He's good on leadership. He's good on technical performance. Um, and uh, I mean, I've only, for, he's my, I, I sort of played around with it actually. Before I thought I had him third, then I had him second overall, but uh, then I had him fourth. But yeah, he's right up there for me. I know I said James Vowles was team principal of the year. For me, he is. But Andrea Stella, Stella actually, I gave more team marks principal to. of the year. Right. Yeah, no, but I gave yes. him more marks because technical performance, I think I I, I just think he's, he's, he's done a better job in that respect. But he probably had better resources to play around with to get that technical performance. But I do remember this time last year, or January last year, when when he was announced as team principal and, and Ted, you and I might have had a conversation that went something along the lines of what? Really? Interesting. Bit left field. Not sure. Is it that there was no one else about and they just had to promote someone from within? And I'm glad to say that all the doubts have massively evaporated. For, for a man whose biggest strength, I think, is patience. And patience with his team and with his drivers, and that patience he then expects from those above him. And if he gets that patience, he then delivers for the team. And he is a brilliant example of how patience is is a is is a is a word that we should all use in our in our daily walk of life, and certainly in our career, because it went so badly for McLaren at the start of the season. They they were they were slower than a slow thing at the start of the year. But behind the scenes, they'd identified that this is what was going to happen and they were working to put it right. And they didn't just rush things to the track. They brought upgrades when they were ready, when the team understood the upgrades, when they knew how it was going to be. And they started in Austria with Lando and they had them both on both cars at Silverstone. And it was an instant impact. To be fair... And I know this because I've spoken to him. Uh, we had a great conversation on the um, on the way to catch a plane, I think it was, to Hungary, where I said, I am never going to believe a word you say to me ever again. And Andrea said, why is that? I said, you told me these upgrades were worth two tenths of a second, you little liar. <laughs> he went, well, we thought they were. I said, yeah. But then when I said to you they're worth a bit more, you still said, no, it's only a couple of tenths. He went, well, I just wanted to make sure first. He said, but 
we don't need to get carried away. We don't want to get carried away. And this was in Hungary. He said, we don't want to get carried away making this car even faster because we might lose focus on next year. We still need to think about next year. That's more important than this year. So I'm, I'm really confident for a good year for McLaren for next season. I think Andrea, like Mike uh, Crack, is an engineer and loves the company of engineers, but also feels very relaxed and very happy speaking to the media too. And he's got to know the media. He's he's engaged with the media, and and we have you know on a Sunday we have a briefing ahead of every every race um, that Andrea gives, and, and it was his idea to do it, and and we get a lot of information, and and we form relationships as well, and and it's been a pleasure to really get to know him properly. Uh, throughout the course of this year. King tennis fan uh, wants to go to Wimbledon uh, next year because he absolutely loves his tennis. Um, you'll find him in the gym working out uh, after he's finished work for the day. I know this because in Spain, I went to a reception and I had to walk past the gym and there he was working out at around about half past nine at night. Uh, therein lies a lesson, Ted, for all of wow. us, uh, yeah. if you want to get on, uh, to be fair. But I, I, I just think... I. I whether whether Zach realised exactly what he'd done uh, and knew what was going to come, I, I don't know. I need to ask Zach this, but he has been a, a, a delight for and, and a surprise to many. And I'm with you, Ted. You know, it's nice to see McLaren on their uppers. It really yeah. is. Fun facts about Andrea Stella, Matthew. He uh, he he likes tennis, and um, the only remaining remaining question is uh, how he couldn't tell to, uh, ask David Croft what he was doing in his car to go to the Hungary airport. But um, uh, it's good that you managed to hitch a lift, Crofty. We, no, no, no. We were, no on a, we, were we were on a bus. We were walking. No, we were walking to the uh, to the gate. We we're on our way to Hungary. Oh, we we're see. walking to the gate. Oh, okay. and we were having a conversation as we as you know, you, going to the airport. One of the one of the best ways to find anything out in Formula One is when you're flying and you're flying and you you get to stand in a queue with people who can't avoid you. Who, when we get to the track, can yeah, find they, they can't leave. Can find areas to avoid you. They can't leave. So you no, know. that's true. I get a lot of that at Stansted and Luton. Yes, um, but uh, no. I mean, I think the other thing, the other thing I should say, uh, nothing wrong with Stansted and Luton airports. Just want to make that clear. Um, is that Stella has been very good with his drivers. Yeah. Um, in Lando's qualifying wobbles and Oscar's first uh, full seat first year, Stella has been great with his drivers, and I think that's important as well. Yeah, they've performed exceptionally well, particularly Oscar Piastri in a rookie season. What what an incredible rookie season he's had. All right, so scores for Stella. Uh, uh, Ted, you gave him 31. 34. Crofty, right? you gave him 34. And I gave him 31 uh, as well. So there we go. All right, let's let's move he's on. We've got right, three right left. There. He's right up there. For me. He's right yeah. up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he certainly is. Uh, let's move on to Ferrari and Fred Vasseur. Now, I thought one of the most interesting parts of uh, Fred Vasseur's season was in Las Vegas when a drain cover ripped through the floor of Carlos Sainz's car. And for me, I don't know what you thought, I felt like it was a bit of a coming of age, is the wrong expression, but a, a kind of arrival of Fred in, a, in an aggressive way because he really stood up for Ferrari, I thought, at that point. He wasn't having it. He was furious with, with F1, with the FA, that this had happened and that ultimately his car, his driver, were going to be impacted negatively as a result yeah. of that. And I thought in the press conference, he's obviously since been fined for, for those comments and for, and for the use of language, but he was absolutely seething, wasn't he? And maybe it was a change from the sort of happy-go-lucky, jovial Fred Vasseur that we're maybe slightly used to seeing. Mm. I thought he really arrived as a as a ferocious and fierce team principal when it mattered most. I think in the glare of the spotlight, yes, you're absolutely right, but he'd already been very much fighting Ferrari's cause behind the scenes at various times and uh, and using the Ferrari muscle uh, for the, the best use uh, of, of his team, you know, behind the scenes during the course of the year. But you're right, we, we, saw, we saw angry Fred. We've actually seen, I think in recent races, more happy Fred as well. I think he was a little bit cagey at the start, as as probably befits a, a man thrust into the glare of the spotlight that is the Ferrari team principal. I think he's done he's done a, a decent job for Ferrari this year. They are the only team other than Red Bull to win a race, so we shouldn't forget that. And Singapore was was a super weekend um, for, for Fred and for Carlos Sainz. Maybe we expected a bit more, but it has been such a dominant season from Red Bull that, that 
no one was really getting that close unless Red Bull had a, had a bad weekend and that was the bad weekend they had. Um, the one thing I think Fred hasn't done to our knowledge yet is to tie down both Charles Leclerc and Carlos Sainz if indeed they are the future for Ferrari and get that contract signed. They've only got another year to go. I don't think they would want to lose either necessarily. Um, and whilst we hear these reports, nothing's coming from Marinello to say, yes, they, these are our drivers. And you would have thought that might have happened by now if those deals had been done. Um, they just lost out on the runners-up spot. He has lost, you know, um, he's lost David Sanchez, hasn't he, to uh, to McLaren. Uh, members of, of, of the team have, have gone, uh, Lauren Mekis, uh, obviously to Alpha Tauri. But I think he's certainly, in, in the case of Lauren Mekis, um, he's, he's got a very good uh, uh, sporting director, uh, Diego Laverno, to come in. And he's just feeling his way into the job. Strategy has been better, but engineering and the engine still need work. For historical accuracy, Matthew, can I uh, say mm. that it was a water valve cover? <laughs> was it? I beg your pardon. Not a drain. <laughs> In the defense of drains everywhere, it was the yes. water valve cover. And... I'd like uh, to see Fred, formally apologize. Fred Vasseur, <laughs> Fred Vasseur in, in the spirit of the season, uh, Fred yes, Vasseur yes. and Toto Wolff were just warned, not fined for their expletives Thank you. Uh, in the Las Vegas <laughs> press conference. But yeah, I mean, let's go through this. I've given Fred Vasseur, actually, funnily enough, I've given him 10 out of 10 top team boss first for the media and sponsorship because he's always been on hand to explain what's going mm. on with Ferrari, even in those horrendous days when it looked like they were tripping over their tails again in the way that they did sometimes last year, but they've been better on that and explaining uh, why they haven't been quite as good uh, last year. I've only put him sixth in the HR because I don't see that he's able... Do you remember they have the big Ferrari uh, recruitment drive yeah. um, mid-season and it's still going on and I haven't seen or heard many, many more people who are coming to Ferrari uh, to replace some of the ones you've lost that you mentioned, Crofty. So that's he's only sixth out of 10 on the HR in terms of getting people in. He's third out of 10 for me in technical performance. That car was not great, but uh, not as good as the one before it. But he has identified in which areas they need to improve and he knows what the drivers want and he knows what's important because he is a racer uh, as well. And in leadership, I've actually put Vassar uh, second as well because I think he stood up not only at that Las Vegas event but at others and uh, defended uh, Ferrari and is getting liked more and more by the Tifosi who weren't sure about him first of all. They thought some of his um, methods of coping by using humour and smiling maybe wasn't taking the for a job of Ferrari team prompt team principal seriously they've been disavowed of that in the biggest possible terms there's, there's no one that, under any doubt now that Fred Vasseur takes that job of Ferrari team principal absolutely seriously and the fact that he didn't speak Italian had a had a something to go by it but he is learning uh, in that way as well so yeah I think overall he's second or th probably third for me I have 32 points out of 40 for Fred Vasseur Ted for Vasseur you have no, 30. Sorry, 30 points can't even add up yeah, now he's third yeah he's third for me yeah yeah, th th 30, yeah, uh, th 30 for, for, for you, Ted, and I gave him 29, uh, the hard taskmaster that I am. <laughs> uh, right, final two that we've got is Toto Wolf and Christian Horner. So obviously in, in championship order, uh, we, we, we'll start with Toto Wolf. finishes second in the championship, Crofty on the face of it, a simple, straightforward season, or was it? It wasn't, was it? For, no, it wasn't. For Toto Wolf. it was up and down, let's uh, to say the least. It wasn't, I think we've seen... Uh, a different side of Toto Wolf this year to, to the Toto Wolf we've seen in previous years because for the second year running, they haven't really been winning much. Um, they haven't won at all. One win the year before. They... It, I don't know what the reasoning was behind the scenes going into this season, but something stopped Mercedes approaching a different concept. Something stopped Mercedes doing what was glaringly obvious, and that was getting rid of the concept they had to go down a different path. And they started the season once again with a car that was not befitting of where they wanted to be. Now, fair play to Toto Wolff. He has made moves behind the scenes to address the problem or the problems. They have gone now in a different direction. He has signed both of his drivers up to new contracts, 
which I think was a massive plus point uh, this year uh, for Mercedes. And they did finish second. But without that driver lineup, without Lewis Hamilton and George Russell, one of the strongest, if not the strongest driver lineups on the grid as a partnership, would they have finished second? No, I don't think they would. Was that a car that deserved to finish second? Probably not, no. Is it the Mercedes we've seen in the past? Definitely not, no. What can Toto Wolff do to drag Mercedes back to their glory days? Because that is the task that now lies ahead of him. Ted, what about his no-blame culture? How does that fit into your uh, into your rankings after a season like we've just I had? I think pretty good, but I think, you know what, you know what? a lot of these teams have no-blame cultures. I don't think Fred Vasseur particularly has a no-blame culture now. You know, you, you will identify areas that you need to sort out, and you will sort them out with great strength and leadership. And funny enough, talking about leadership, that's the only category where I've put Toto top of the list. In leadership, in, dis in direction in um, inspiring the team, which I think still think he is the best leader, watching him from the outside, they would, people at Mercedes would jump off a cliff with Toto Wolff, wouldn't they? They would go into battle with him. Um, he just instills that uh, that leadership. And that maybe that's a ha hangover from the seven uh, drivers and eight world constructors championships you know, of the past. But I, I still have him as leadership because he keeps the drivers happy. He keeps the sponsors, some amazing sponsors on that Mercedes team. Yes, it helps being a part of an OEM, a manufacturer, of course. With the media and sponsorship, I put for Toto third. Um, with uh, the HR, I've put him fourth uh, because of some of the, the details with Mike Elliott and James Allison, which we'll talk about in a second. And technical performance, uh, I've put him where the car is with second. But uh, yeah, you know, the thing was with, with me about Toto, the only thing I've marked him down on was his keenness to uh, throw the concept away so publicly after first after qualifying in Bahrain. For whatever reason, Crofty, and we don't really know why he managed to sign off, why he did sign off on the sister of the, the, the bad car, which is as Lewis Hamilton described it. W14 was the sister of W13, and they were both not great cars. Toto must have signed it off. Otherwise, you know, he, he could have said, he could have, as a leader and a strong leadership, he could have said, I disagree. Let's go with the Red Bull concept. But whatever reason they didn't, he signed it off. And then for that very first, I remember the interview vividly, coming out so strongly and kind of took me aback when he said it. He said, this car is, we, it's bad. We're, we're calling it a start. This was after qualifying the first race, wasn't yeah. it? It wasn't even a right. race. I know he's right, but 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 to immediately throw the whole concept in the trash can then was the only way that I'm I'm slightly thinking that it wasn't quite the calm assured Toto leadership that we've seen. But but I don't think we saw the calm assured Toto leadership uh, at, at all times uh, last year. And I think if you're talking leadership, was his leadership proactive or reactive? Was he reacting more to situations than proactive, guiding the destiny of his own team? And, and the decision not to get rid of the sister long before it came onto the track meant that in the early stages, a lot of it was very reactive. The, the little technical shuff, shuffle around was reactive. And one of the, I think, strengths of Mercedes since 2014 has been they're not following a trend. They're, they're, they're plowing their own furrow for others to follow. And that is not the case at the moment, it seems, from the outside. I think that's a fair comment. Yep. It's going to be a very different car next year. <laughs> I think, I think we, we, we look, look forward to testing and, and seeing seeing how far it's come. Do, do we get into the James Allison, Mike Elliott thing? Um, he saw that, that he made them agree between themselves. He, As far as the public was concerned, public image was concerned, it was all Mike Elliott's uh, idea to step back as technical director, then go to chief technical officer, and then go to, uh, to fields new, pastures new. Um, with that all resolved, uh, James Allison really will, you know, step up. You'd expect him to step up. And I think Toto's probably learned a lot from these uh, two unsuccessful seasons. You know, one win in two seasons. Um, and, and he's probably learned a lot from that. But, you know, he's got his failings, Toto Wolf, And maybe not being reactive uh, is one of them. But, you know, you've got to say that he's got his strengths. And, you know, the recent 
the recent issues, let's say, with uh, with with the FIA, has shown that Toto's not afraid afraid to fight for himself, him, for his family, and for his team. And and so he should. And as a team owner as well, maybe has a slightly longer term view on performance and where Mercedes are going than maybe if, it, if, if he wasn't a team owner. Okay, let's uh, oh, well, uh, let's go through our scores. So, um, Ted, you gave him 32 yeah. points. Uh, Crofty, you gave him 32. 32 points as well. And I gave him uh, 27. Wow, okay. <laughs> You, it's a running theme here. You can make a, you can make oh, a very good dear. point that, that, that Toto should be either second or third or fourth. You could make a good argument yeah. for either of those positions. Yeah, I, I went very low on technical performance. With yeah, five, well, that's so fine. That's, that's, that's fair. That's fair. Absolutely fair. Yeah, a long, a long way off Red Bull. All right, final, final one. And we all agree, according to our, our numbers, that is the, the best team principal of 2023. And that's that's Christian Horner, obviously after the, the record-breaking season that they had. Um, where, where, where to begin, really? I think you can't... We've all gone 10 for technical performance because I think with a car that won every race but one, you have to say that that is the best technical achievement possibly ever in the sport in terms of that car. Yep. And and surely, I mean, that's, that's as far... That's as good as it gets. If they'd won Singapore, I don't know. I mean, would, is it nine point nine? Maybe if they'd won Singapore, we would have we would have given them ten. No, it, it, it was the standout car, and Christian Horner is not designing that car, but he is enabling the design team, the aero team, the chassis team, to uh, you know the, the engine team to to run their business with you know management, but not micromanagement, and empowering and enabling people to do their jobs. And you have to give them a 10 out of 10 because they, they, they've won everything at a canter. So, you know, you, you can't really mark them down at all. Um, leadership, overall direction of the team. You know, once upon a time and, and not that long ago, we're all sat here going, cool, Red Bull, Red Bull are going to have trouble, aren't they? They haven't got an engine for the future. You know, who's going to power it? Who's going to power their engine? What are they going to do? Look at the way. You know, Christian Horner saw a long-term vision for Honda and then for their own powertrain, you know, so that, you know, they are now a works team and a works team of their own engine. And that will continue on, you know, even when Ford come in in 2026, he's brought Ford back into Formula One. And that happened uh, this year as well. Yeah. Um, he has big blue chip companies sponsoring them. Um, I've seen... Christian, the, the, the way he interacts with the partners and the sponsors. And he's an inspiring figure uh, for them. He really is. Um, I've seen the way he interacts with, 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 the, with the crew, at the track and, and back at the factory. And he's a guy that you can go and, ch and talk to. Whoever you are, you can go and have a chat with Christian Horner. He talks to the media as if we're all old friends. And quite frankly, we are because we've known him for forever and ever. You know, he, he's a racer. And... Whatever, whatever people from the outside think about Christian Horner, and I know he, he kind of divides opinion sometimes, and probably Abu Dhabi 2021, you know, is part and parcel of that. But there is no better team principal for the team that is Red Bull than Christian Horner. They, they, the two fit absolutely perfectly. And he has turned them from, you know, what was a, a bit of a, you know, half decent outfit in Milton Keynes to world leaders, and you know should be applauded for that. I don't think he always gets everything right. I I, I think that he probably still has problems behind the scenes, and dealing with the drivers is probably his biggest problem. Um, not necessarily as characters, but the people behind the drivers and trying to keep everybody happy, which is a nice problem to have when you've got the winning car. But you know, he he is absolutely the right person for Red Bull and you've got to hand it to him in, in what he has developed and, and the culture he's developed at Milton Keynes. Yeah, is, is so I think we've all gone high. HR is the one that we've we've gone a bit lower. Ted, you've gone sixth. Yeah. Uh, Crofty, seven. I've gone seven. Is is that what Crofty was saying there, Ted, that, that perhaps, for example, managing Sergio Perez and managing his season, could there have been other things that, Christian could have done to, to smooth that process over? Well, possibly, but it's a bit complicated where it comes to, you know, who's around and above Christian Horner at Red Bull. But so going back to technical performance uh, just briefly, 
you know, we have to say Adrian Newey, Pierre Vachet, all of those people, um, some of them, you know, not so well known uh, to the public, uh, who created RB19 off the mm. back of a very successful RB18. You know, hats off to all of them. Incredible car. Technical performance cannot be beaten. And I think the only way um, you could mark down Christian Horner this year is for the way that the Sergio Perez situation dealt was dealt with and the way that he was not able um, to control Helmut Marco. Now, Helmut Marco, you know, is uncontrollable. He's an uncontrollable force. Um, but, you know, Marco's unacceptable comments about Sergio Perez uh, were not very quickly jumped on because... You know, he can't. And in, 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 in a way, this is the genius of, of what Horner has managed to achieve at Red Bull Racing. Because, you know, say what you want about Christian Horner, but he is juggling some situations, some hot stones that you have got no idea how difficult they are. He is juggling um, uh, some component and volatile parts. Max Verstappen, who can be shown that when the car isn't to his liking, is very vocal about it and can mm -hmm. have a short fuse on the radio with GP as engineer. We know that when things aren't going around. He's juggling Helmut Marko, who's the definition of a loose cannon. He's juggling Oliver Mintzlaff, his new boss at Red Bull Racing, who is finding his way in charge of the racing program since the passing, as we said earlier, uh, as D uh, Dietrich Matschitz. He's juggling Checo Perez and, and getting Checo back into what they want to do. And uh, he's juggling the sort of, you know, everything else, the political side uh, of Formula One. So he is doing an amazing job. Christian Hall is doing an amazing job considering the amount he has got to deal with. And then the HR thing, I just marked him down because because of the Marco comments on on on, on Checo Perez. And you know what it, 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 it boiled down to? I remember saying this on Notebook, Matt and Crofty. At the end, it's like Sergio Perez, you know, once they dealt with those comments from Marco, could Perez not say to, go, to, to Helmut, okay, we've dealt with that. I've forgiven you. Can you stop being so mean to me now? And that's what it came down to me, you know, and if you, if, if, I'm sure if Christian could do this year again, he'd say to Helmer, or maybe he'd say to himself, do you know what, I think we can give Checo a bit of a break here. We don't need to be mean to him. It's not the, it's not the stick. He doesn't respond to what else the stick. Let's give him a bit more of the carrot. And that's the only way that I marked him down. But clearly he's still, you know, the, the team boss of the year. No, no question. See, I think that's where I would slightly disagree. He's not team boss of the year if you're looking at the Helmut Marco situation and, and marking him down, because what Christian tried to do behind the scenes was very much the right thing. But he didn't have the power to say to the brand and overturn what the brand wanted in terms of putting out statements, when a statement needed to be coming from the team straight away. And at that stage, Christian had his hands tied a little bit. Um, yeah, but statements, now, schmatements. I mean, you know. Yeah, but he, 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 he stop, wanted uh, he tell wanted Helmut to, to stop being so mean to Checo. Yeah, you know? but yeah, you can you can, we could all say that and should say that. However, Helmut's not going to listen. What Christian wanted to do was put a statement out straight away because he wanted to show the support to Sergio because that was the right thing to do and the only right thing to do. But as far as I understand it the Red Bull brand didn't want to do that. Don't forget Helmut Marko, technically, is not an employee of Red Bull Racing. He works for Red Bull. Apparently, Matt, they're two different things. They are. But, um, and, and, and look, Christian said this to me once. I went, yeah, but the trouble is he stood at the back of your garage in, in, and he's got a Red Bull jacket on and he looks like he's part of the team. So, no, that's not going to wash with anybody. But sometimes, you know, Christian hasn't quite got the authority on a very, very senior level with a brand that you would expect or he would hope to have to solve a situation very quickly. And that, I think, played out in and around Singapore when eventually the statement from Helmet did come a few days too late. The only way, Matt, I would mark, and I, I trailed this at the beginning, so I should probably deliver on what I was saying. The only thing I would also mark Christian Horner down is for his increasing enthusiasm for Instagram, like in this form of James Vowles that you're saying. He loves a celebrity photo at the front of the grid, doesn't he, Who Christian? Doesn't? He loves it. But my favourite one was when Shaquille O'Neal came, was delayed. Do you remember Martin's Grid, what was live on it? And Martin was like, okay, where's Shaq going? Uh, okay, he's going to have his photo 
they're taken with Christian Horner. Okay, must be a guest of Red Bull, I guess. That's why he's taking photos. Although uh, Machine Gun Kelly was also taking a picture with, uh, with Christian at the front of the grid. And then Shaq comes back and Martin says, Shaquille, Shaquille, one word. And he was Lewis Hamilton, baby. And it's like, yeah. Hang on, Brilliant. if you are a Red Bull, if you are a Red Bull guest, it's not, it's not Hang on. the same. It's not the party not line. Matt, can I just say, and I'd like to give people a reason for staying to the end of this podcast, um, that yeah. I'm not taking that from uh, from my uh, erstwhile and learned friend here about Christian <laughs> Horner stalking celebrities. Yeah. Because if you remember when Adam Driver came to Austin, yeah, right, he could not move for Ted Kravitz being within about five yards, <laughs> skulking in the shadows as Adam Driver walked about the paddock. I mean, I'm amazed that that brilliant opening we did, I'm, I'm stunned that you didn't get into every single shot. You were one that close time, to him. One time, one yeah, time. Yeah, I know, but don't every, you start... Every celebrity has to have a, a picture with Christian Horner in front of a Red Bull, whether they're Red Bull guests or not. And by the way, at Monza, he was in the film. He was in the Brad Pitt shooting film. Yes. There's a scene where, um, I saw them shooting it, where um, uh, the guy who plays um, the baddie in uh, Killing Eve, um, Danish actor, I've forgotten his name briefly. Um, he's the technical director. He mm. came and in the film, he came and looked under the Red Bull's diffuser and then Christian Horner stands in his way and tells him to clear his hook. Uh, Kim Bodnia, there we go, Kim Bodnia, really? I remember. Yeah, so that was, uh, so Horner is in the film. So that was um, on the grid in Monza. They did that on the real live grid. We were standing wow. there. I was looking at what's going on, you know, cars, interesting. It's like, oh, they're shooting a scene of the film. Oh, it's Kim Bodnia from Killing Eve. Oh, Christian Horner's telling him to sling his hook. Oh, right, okay. So I think they've missed a trick. What they should have done was offer him the part of, uh, of Gunter Steiner. They should have offered Gunter Steiner the part of Fred Vasseur. Fred Vasseur could have played Mike Crack. Mike, Cla Mike Crack could have played Toto Wolf. James Vowles could have played Bruno Famine. Bruno Fanum could have played Franz Tost. And we could have carried on with this. Just swap it around a bit. See how these team principals yes. fared in another uniform. All right. People want to go and have their Christmas, uh, want to have their, their, their second, their turkey pie. People want to have the, 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 the leftovers, <laughs> Crofty. It's time for dinner. Time for the Hour results, Matt. Later. Right. Time for the time results. Time for the results. Finally. Do, 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 do. We've, done some, we, we, we've done some questionable maths. And I think we've just about settled on an okay. order with our, with our criteria. So, in last place, but for, but for reasons we've justified, Alessandro Aluni Bravi in 10th. Bruno Famine in 9th. Mike Crack in 8th. No. Surprise. It's gone quite, yeah. Gone quite okay. low. Ted, you I, put him I, slightly I higher. Sixth, but carry on, yep. Yeah, all right, okay. Franz Tost in seventh. Yeah. Gunter Steiner in sixth, which I think is interesting. I think uh, you could maybe put... I had I had, good, I had Gunter put, eighth and crack sixth, but yeah, carry on. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, Vasseur in fifth. Then Wolf, uh, sorry, Toto Wolf, it's given their full titles, in fourth. James Vowles in third position. Uh -huh. Andrea Stella in second wow. position, Stella which second. I think is interesting. Is 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 an interesting result, but I but I think fully justified. Yep. And I think after a brilliant season, that, that that's fair enough. And then Christian Horner in first position. Funnily which enough, is, given, and given master and, and pupil, I think Vowles and Wolf are probably too close to call in that order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're, they're right next to each other uh, in, in that order. So, yeah, look, very, very interesting. Who would be a team principal? Well, <laughs> not me, for starters. It's yeah. hard enough trying to rate them, uh, let alone try and do the job. Uh, thankless task for which, yeah. for which their only recompense is first-class flights, chauffeured cars, and million-pound salaries. No, I, I, I digress. No, I, I, it is a thankless <laughs> task, but do you know what? I, I bet it is one of the mo more fun things to do in life, leading a Formula One team and potentially to victory. Um, that, that, that list I, I do find fascinating, um, but I will put the disclaimer in that, that James Vowles is team principal of the year, whatever <laughs> our math suggests on that. Forget the maths. Forget the maths. Forget everything we've just said. James Val's two principal. And of the on year. that bombshell, <laughs> Merry New Year, yeah. everybody.
maybe it's a thankless task. It's a task that comes with, it must be a headache. You know, you think the driving is actually the fun bit where you get to drive the cars. Uh, and then everybody comes to all the team bosses with all their complaints and their troubles. And team bosses has to have to fight. But, you know, just going back to the words of the late Sir Sterling Moss, they are all racers. And with some of them, maybe at the bottom of the uh, 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 the list who we, we have a great deal of respect for, but probably aren't in the job um, as a named team principal uh, or uh, are in there only as an interim job. We have the utmost respect for all of them because it is a very difficult job. And they are all, at the end of the day, as the Sterling would say, racers. But so are we. And that's why we thought we'd have this bit of fun just to uh, uh, see where we place them. But please comment uh, as in the, in the comments uh, as to where you have the team bosses of the year. Because, yeah. of course, we want to hear uh, our viewers and our listeners' uh, points of view as well. 100%. I'm sure there will be some polite disagreement uh, in the comments below. Uh, right, Ted, Crofty, thank you very much. That was uh, thoroughly enjoyable. And uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New, New Year. Year. And to you guys, take care.